<laughs> okay, but I'll do justice. I'll finish everything before 15 minutes, right? Okay, so at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Chitra and the team ARC AIOS for giving or for arranging this wonderful webinars with so wonderful speakers. So I'll be covering on eyelid reconstruction, which I always believe to be one of the most challenging areas in the reconstructive plastic surgery because it requires a very delicate interplay of anatomy aesthetic and function correction, and the most important is the protection of the underlying globe and the vision. So the key to the surgery of the eyelid is a thorough knowledge of the anatomy, which already Adit has shown very well, but the most important, the subunits of this periocular region, and also the blood vessel and the enzymes, which I'll be discussing later. So Adit has already shown the anatomy, but what is very integrate about the eyelid is, if you look at the eyelid uh, as a such, after the tarsus, you see it has got two lamellae, that is the anterior, which consists of the skin and orbicularis, and the posterior, which consists of the tarsus, the mucosa. But in the same eyelid, when you look to the septal region, it has got three lamella, where we have an anterior, posterior, and a middle, which usually consists of the septum and the retractus. So this is what we see that in the, some part of the same eyelid, you have got two layers, and some part you have got the three layers. So during this lid reconstruction, what is most important is that we should replace like for like tissue and each having the different properties and we need to respect its function and the aesthetic properties. So the most important tissues that we use are basically the grafts and the flap, but one should always remember that the graft can be laid over a flap and the flap can be laid over a graft, but uh, sorry, flap can be laid over a flap but the graph cannot be laid on another graph. So what we understand is that if you look here, the traditional teaching, like all of uh, like all the previous speakers, they have shown that basically how do we replace the lamellar structure by the combination of either the graphs and the flaps. So if you look at the difference between the graph and the flaps, what we see is that the graphs are basically limited to the only the skin, but what the flap consists of the skin, the muscle and the fascia, it has its own blood supply, it gives a better color. It is more adaptable to the weight bearing area. And also it can be used on bed with questionable nutrition. And most important is that it can breach the defect. So if we look ahead to this reconstructive ladder, what we know that based on the requirement, based on the complexity, we need to select the procedure, which can be a very simple procedure like this, or we can go ahead with a much complex procedure. But what we need to remember is that we have to give the best functional and the aesthetic result to the patient. So for the postgraduates, it's very important that when you plan for a lead reconstruction, you should know what is the algorithm. Until today, the most important or common algorithm for the lead reconstruction is basically a weight base. So this is the weight based algorithm which many of us have been following, which is based on the size of the defect and the laminar involvement wherein the defects are classified based on the 25 percentage increase of the eyelid weight. But, and if you look to all this, I think this is very important for the postgraduate. If you look to this, like all the four um, uh, parts of the periocular region where we have a defect is basically uh, um, divided on the basis of the horizontal width, which can be either a mine, small, medium, large, based on how much amount of the width is being involved, or even in the medial and lateral cantle on the basis of width invo involved that is approximately whether it is less than 1.5 centimeter or more than 1.5 centimeter, we usually divide it into small, large, and medium, and the large. But what is the most important point that has been overlooked here is that the missing verticals. So what we knew when we do a lead reconstruction, we also need to reconstruct the vertical components. And what we know that with increase in the vertical height, the ability to use the local flaps without giving much tension becomes more challenging. So this led to a very interesting paper where they have divided for the algorithm for the lead reconstruction, they have divided in consideration of the vertical height. As you can see here, all the upper, lower, middle, cantle, and the lateral cantle region has been divided into four types, and where and they have been further subdivided based on the involvement of the tissue, where type 1A is the area where the tarsal region is involved, but not the tarsal plate. And 1B, when you have this region being involved, that is in blue, but it is also involving the tarsal plate. The type 2 is involving the preceptal defect, but it is not involving the tarsus. 
three, that is a um, red zone, that is a lithium junction. And if you have a combination that is a gray out here, or if you have a combination involving the pre-tarsal, pre-septal, and eye lithium junction, it is known as a type 4 defect. So based on this vertical um, in algorithm, the many of the reconstructions, especially in relation to the flaps are being done. And this has also helped for especially the postgraduate to know the competency of the surgery, like how in the FACO we have the ICO Oscar ru uh, rubrics. In the same way, here also you have a score rubrics for the lead reconstruction in terms of aesthetic and function outcome, where the four major criteria, the position, the lead margin, the quality of the skin, and the lateral cantal angle. And then you give a score from zero to one, one being the maximum and zero being the least, and you can have your own competence level. So when we talk about the lead reconstruction, we all know that the indications can be either congenital or acquired. I'm going really fast. And this evaluation, I'll not go into details because Dr. Vidya has shown so beautifully how to evaluate the lead. So these are the important points to be taken into consideration. A very important point is the contralateral eyelid evaluation. So when we reconstruct, we reconstruct this as a reconstruction of the anterior lamella, posterior lamella, or the full thickness. And the anterior lamella, the easiest, when I was mentioning about the reconstructive ladder, the easiest is this, the lazy fair, where it goes by secondary healing. But the other anterior lamella structures that are used for reconstruction are the skin flaps and also the skin, um, and the, also the other small procedure. Usha had shown the Z plus T very well, where we have the two flaps at 60 degree, transpose in the opposite direction, which helps to overcome all the adhesions and also the scar. And this is how you also release all the psychiatrization. You can also use the localized flap, the most common being the bilob flap and also the Lindbergh's the rhomboid flap, but also you can have the sliding flap, advancement flap, and a rotation flap. Skin grafting has been shown very well by my previous speaker, which can be a post auricular full thickness, and you get a very nice cosmetic result. Sometimes a trauma case also repaired elsewhere where it was not repaired well, and in that situation also you might have to give a skin grafting, and you get beautiful results with even with the post auricular skin. But what is important is sometimes you need too much of skin. In such situation, you need to take a split thickness skin graft. And this is a very nice way of having a large amount of large uh, skin. And this is the, the requirement, especially in situation like this, in the burn situation, when you need to salvage the vision because of the total psychiatrization which has occurred following the burn. And for the posterior lamella, what we as uh, the oculoplasty surgeon, we prefer is the lip mucus membrane because it is very easy to harvest. But uh, sometimes if you have a linear scar, we go for the Z plasty. And when you need a tarsus with a conjunctiva, we usually go for the heart um, and the, um, the heart pellet graft. So how do we repair the full thickness? The most, the easiest way, when you, again, here we go to the WIT, the horizontal WIT algorithm, which many of us are following, but here also we need to see the vertical algorithm. If it is up to 50% of the defect, we usually go for the lead closure and direct closure, and which was, which is one of the easiest techniques was the Burroughs technique that is a far, far, near, 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 far, far, which is a very long incision. But what I believe is simply you do a far, far, near, near incision, like three millimeter from the incision, one millimeter deep, you give a um, far in, um, um, I mean, bite, then you go to a near and near. So far, far, near, near is also a very simple, uh, I mean, technique where you put the first switch on the gray line, then followed by the switch on the lash line, the tassels and the skin. But you should always remember that the end point of the lid you know, margin should be inverted in order to prevent a notch appearance in the post-operative period. But if you have a lesion, if you need to repair something between 50 to 70, in spite of doing cantotomy, cantolysis, you're not being able to have a good, I mean, a position of the board, I mean, the cotton. The other option is the lateral advancement flap, which is also known as the tensile semicircular flap, usually done it for the lower lid, but also it can be done for the upper lid. So this is a very simple way where you get a very good position by making a, just a lateral advancement with a semicircular incision, and you can also very nice do a suturing, and also it gives a very good result. But what about the upper, the upper defect? When you have a large defect of more than 75 percentage, for the upper lid, we usually do the cutlet procedure or the master this lead switch flap or the glabular flap. So this cutler bed procedure is like what you do when you make a, I mean, have need to repair a, as big a lesion in the upper lid. 
you have a full thickness tissue from the lower lid and you fill it as a bridge cap and then you keep it and you separate it after the after six weeks and you have a very nice functional eyelid and this is a small surgery this is just a one minute surgery i'll be going fast and you can see as adit has already shown the different types of sebaceous gland carcinoma where these are the lesions which are really very like because of the vegetative spread it really ends up cutting too much of tissue and also the map biopsy is very important what i prefer when you plan for a cutler bed you have only the anterior and the posterior lamellae without the tarsus so you need to give a tarsus when you really have more than 75% defect of the upper lid so i take the tarsus and the conjunctiva from the other eyelid and this is being used to form the posterior lamella as in the beginning of my lecture i was already mentioning this is the closure of the donor area now you go to the recipient area and this is a big lesion that we have seen that is a big repair we need to do so from the lower lid you need to fashion this is the i mean the dog ear that has been excised so you are getting the two lamellae here and this is how you send for the map biopsy after excising most of the tumor and now from the lower lid you have only the two layers so what in order to give a tarsus the structural support i have taken the tarsus from the other lid and you need to form this is the fornicial conjunctiva so what i do i take the fornicial conjunctiva of the upper lid suture it to the tarsus the tarso conjunctival i mean graft that it's has been taken from the other lid and then what you do the the lower tissue that is the flap that you have done this is the conjunctiva of the lower lid and this forms a posterior lamella as i have already mentioned you it should be formed by layer by layer so the next layer as you can see here this is the middle lamella which i had already mentioned it is a levator palpebral superior muscle which is the upper lid retractor you need to take out this middle layer and then you need to suture the second layer which is being sutured to the tarsus so now you have the two layers so you have formed the posterior layer you have formed the middle layer and the third more, most important reconstruction is the first layer that is anterior lamella which basically consists of the skin and the orbicularis i take a bite along in the lps so that you get the nice beautiful crease post operatively and then you suture go for the closure of the wound <coughs> In six weeks, we usually need a cut and cut this. And this is after the six weeks where you need to divide this. Where you need to divide this. Uh, to, uh, divide the lid. And this is what I'm going to discuss. And this is what we can see. We have a nice separate the lid. And this is after the lid. We can cut the upper lid away. And then for the lower lid, you need to fashion. and the closure for the closure and this is what we usually do after 6 weeks and this is the result that you see this is same patient having <coughs> sorry a sebaceous gland carcinoma and you can see a beautiful lid crease that has come and it looks very much like that of a natural lid these are some of the patient where you have gone the cutler bed to see the with a very good reconstruction and sometimes you see because these have a vegetative spread you can see that it has really you need to uh, do a very big extension but when you really need to uh, really reconstruct the whole lid you need to give also structural support here i have used a sclera to form the tarsus and rest of the procedure is same that i have shown you before and this is after the separation of the lid <clears throat> muscle lid switch is another technique the importance of this that you get the eyelashes so this is a child who came to me with a colomoma when she was 3 years and then we I had the lid switch procedure and then you can see the end result you can see the eyelashes out here and this is a very nice technique and now she comes to me now she is almost 18 19 years and but still i think i need to do a little refinement here but the advantage is that you also retain the eyelashes in such situation sometimes you really need to have a very big excision the whole of the lid goes a fixed flap technique is a very nice technique like under the situation a sebaceous gland where the initial when i have first excised the frozen section showed the medial ends and the lateral are involved you keep on cutting it till you end, end up cutting the whole of the lid so this is again the tarso conjunctiva taken from the other lid and then this is a fixed flap that is a forehead flap that has been taken and this is the reconstruction that you see and it gives a very good post operative result and also if you look to here this leg of tenus is not much there and it gives a very good closure for the lower lid the most common is a modified hughes flap and also for a much bigger lesion we go for the mastitis cheek rotation or the tripius flap which we call the bucket handle and also the, the other types of flap 
So this modified Gux flap, which is usually what you have, you have only the posterior demilla that you take it from the upper leg and you make an incision four millimeter behind this um, the uh, the in this, uh, anterior part of the tarsus and this the tarsus and the conjunctiva is being switched to the lower leg. And why I was mentioning the condition of the upper other leg is important and the surrounding tissue. If it is you, you need to mobilize the surrounding skin to form the anterior lamina, or you can also use a full thickness skin graft because you already have a flap giving a good blood supply and again after six weeks or so you can separate it and give a very good nice functional and cosmetic result to the lid and this is how we do and the humus is also another nice technique this is nice technique because in some situation where this is the only eye you cannot do a huge procedure because you know, the, the eye gets closed by i mean both the lids coming together so here you can have a tarso conjunctival flap from the upper and the lower uh, lower lid. And so you can keep the eye remaining. It can stay as a seeing eye. And the anterior lamella you can also cover with, with the skin. And the midline forehead flare, which can be done for the upper lid, can be done for the lower lid. It gives a good correction. And in situation like this, when you have the involvement of the whole of the lower lid and also the upper lid. So in this type of situation, you can do something like the TPS flap. And also here I have reconstructed the tarsus by taking the periosteum and I have divided it into two parts where one forms a tarsus, lateral tarsus of the upper lid. The other forms the lateral tarsus of the lower lid. And then with the bucket and the te technique, you can also form the TPS flap. Mustardy for the, I think for the students, it becomes too much, but I'm just touching it. It is usually for reconstruction of very large vertical defect. This is the type four defect that I have mentioned it. And you need to really reconstruct using a big myocritin flap going right up to the trigger's. And, but what we understand, these are just my last three slides. What we understand is that all these years we are using the random flap. It can be either a fixed flap, it can be a rotational flap, it can be a glabular flap or the tasteless flap, the tipious flap or the vascular flap. But what we have um, realized that, that what is the maximum uh, blood per, uh, perfusion that is allowed for the flap, because sometimes after doing such a beautiful surgery, you can have an end point necrosis. So this is a very interesting study where they have done the blood perfusion by using a high resolution thermography and they have found that as we go away from the base, the red is a flap and the black is an index skin, index skin. And the blue you see that means there's a loss of blood supply at the tip. So as we go away from the base, what happens is the blood perfusion also decreases. There are lots of studies on it, and you can see that maximum which is being allowed is three centimeters because that three centimeter they have shown that 80% of the proficient is maintained. And it depends upon the degree of rotation. If you rotate by 90%, you can see that if you have the blue out here, that means there's some amount of the proficient decrease. And if you rotate by 180 degrees, the chance the proficients are much decreased. So then why, how do we prevent such necrosis? And the new concept today is the endosome-based uh, reconstruction. So this is my last slide, but I want to maintain that we should know all the endosomes of the face. And today, the use of this concept of the random, uh, I mean, the myocritinous flap that we have been uh, doing is not much considered, especially when you really need a big flap, either from the temporal area or in cases of master disease. So in such situation, we need to go for the endosome-based uh, reconstruction. And the most important part over here is this endosomes are basically a 3D composite unit of skin and underlying tissue, having a source artery with one side the arteriosome, the other side of the venosome. But most important thing that these endosomes have the choke anastomosis. So because of this, if we look to the face, we have beautiful five areas of function endosome, each having its own so source artery, which can be either the facial or it can be ophthalmic. And you have this choke anastomosis. So when when you go for a bigger flap, my goodness flap, it is very nice if you get, especially for the temporal, you need to follow this endosome. And as because you have this choke anastomosis here, the chance of flap survival is very important. And also for the uh, master D, we can go for the lower endosome. So with this, I conclude by mentioning 
that I said the focal point for the function and the cosmic of facial cosmosis. There are varieties of technique available for the periocular reconstruction, but the most important one should have a thorough knowledge about the anatomy. You need to replace layer by layer. And the second most you need to know about the blood supply, you need to know how the exosomes are being, I mean, designed, and this gives a much uh, I mean, better outcome. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasturi, um, for so much clarity in your talk. I think uh, there might be questions, but uh, we're really running uh, out of time. Any one question, Dr. Akshay, which is to be asked, or shall we conclude? Uh, no, there was one question that came about what is the preferred duration for keeping the flap in cases of lid sharing procedures, especially in children. Do you want it to be uh, shorter, longer? It depends in whether you, the technique that you do. If you have a very good vascularity, if you have a very good uh, I mean, supply, what the textbook says that it is for six weeks. But if you look to some studies, the study says that even you can release at three weeks. Why they are saying because of the periocular blood supply. And there was a very nice study by the Bordoris group where they have shown that if you have a flap which is approximately 13 millimeters, so if you have a flap with a 13 millimeter, you can separate it even before two weeks. But if you have something more than like around two, 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 two centi, 20, uh, 20 millimeter, that is a two centimeter, it is preferable to wait for six weeks. Right. 